Think Forward. Think Research Channel. speaker today, uh, Doug Kerr, uh, is in fact from Johns Hopkins, uh, where I had a lot of good years, good formative years, and uh, it was nice to catch up with him uh, about Hopkins. He's uh, Associate uh, Professor of Neurology, uh, Molecular Microbiology and Immunology. He's the director of the Hopkins Transverse Myelitis Center. Uh, he received both his medical degree and his PhD from uh, Jefferson Medical College uh, in Philadelphia. He completed an internship in medicine at the Graduate Hospital in Philadelphia, and then went on to complete his residency in neurology and chief residency at uh, the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Uh, as I said, he's now Associate Professor of Neurology at Hopkins, uh, serving as the director of the Transverse Myelitis Center. Uh, and that center focuses on comprehensive evaluation of transverse myelitis. His research focuses on the etiologies of transverse myelitis and the development of new treatment uh, options. And uh, in particular, Dr. Kerr uh, is focusing on stem cells uh, as a tool for functional recovery in patients with transverse myelitis and other motor neuron diseases. So uh, I would ask Dr. Kerr to uh, join me here at the podium. Uh, Doug, I do have a, uh, a memento of your visit here. Uh, in Kentucky, we like to give away mint julep cups. Uh, and I'm sure you understand the significance of that. And uh, it's great to have you here. Your visit here is much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for, for having me, for inviting me. This is a, a real honor to be a part of this uh, seminar series. And uh, while here, I have become increasingly aware that this is an unbelievably world-class institution. I've really been amazingly impressed at the uh, clinical care, the clinical research, and the basic science research. And, and I was here, I guess, four years ago at the request of uh, Dr. Berger, and, and just the strides that the neurology department has made since then are just really outstanding. And so I, I commend him and, and the whole uh, department for that, and indeed the whole institution. I, uh, I should just mention that I have no conflicts or vested interests. I actually don't have a slide on that. Last time I said that in a lecture, somebody said, well, why not? But indeed, I don't have any conflicts here to report. I won't give any off-label. What I will talk about <coughs> is um, my lab interest and how that kind of dovetails with a clinical interest uh, for me at Johns Hopkins. And in the lab, I am very interested in mechanisms of neural injury, focusing really exclusively in the spinal cord, motor neuron biology, motor neuron diseases, and uh, paralysis. And clinically, that's quite similar. Uh, inflammatory neural injury in the spinal cord and transverse myelitis, which we have a, a clinical center for, and it's also a research center. So the outline of what I will talk about today focuses really the first part on neurodegeneration, and then I'm going to shift a bit to neuroregeneration. And what I'll start with is really an excitatory motor neuron death in the spinal cord and try to uh, highlight some relevance to that in paralysis. And then I'm going to talk about synaptic stripping or, or pullback of synapses onto motor neurons as really a, a non-cell death mechanism for paralysis that maybe we don't know enough about. And it may indicate potential therapeutic strategies in the future uh, to modulate this aspect, whereas, for example, a cell death mediated cause of paralysis is, is uh, not treatable until you start talking about stem cells. And then I'm going to shift to the neuroregeneration aspect, talking about embryonic stem cells. And first, I think, is the most important use of an embryonic stem cell is really not as a therapeutic tool, but as a biological tool to study diseases. And so I will talk very briefly about uh, creating a cell culture model using embryonic stem cells to study ALS, uh, 
and a little bit more detail about spinal muscular atrophy, a genetic motor neuron disorder. And then finally, I will shift to the therapeutic aspect in which we have transplanted embryonic stem cell derived motor neurons into a paralyzed adult rat. I will uh, focus on the work of five people in the lab, uh, Tara, Young Suk, Jen, uh, Jessica, and Katie, our postdocs and graduate students in my lab, and I'll, I'll indicate what they've done at various points. Um, I, won't, I won't go over all of the collaborators is, except to suggest that Jeff Rothstein and Han Jung Song at Hopkins have been very close collaborators. And down at the bottom on that left side, Tom Jessel and Hinnick Wichterly at Columbia have really done beautiful work teaching us how to make motor neurons out of embryonic stem cells. It's really a seminal work that we've then, it's kind of launched uh, much of what I have done. What I will tell you about is a model of a viral induced model of motor neuron injury, neuroadapted Synbis virus. Uh, Synbis virus, named after a place in Egypt in which it was first isolated, is a uh, pathogenic human virus and it causes a respiratory infection, but its biggest use has been as an animal model of a fulminant encephalomyelitis. So this virus, NSV, given intracranially or intranasally, induces a fulminant encephalitis, the animal gets quite sick, and uh, then the virus is cleared by immunologic mechanisms, and as the virus is being cleared, paralysis sets in. And it's a fulminant, complete paralysis. And I want to talk about that because it's, it's become an interesting model to study how motor neurons die. It is a very specific motor neuron death. Um, and I, I, I use this to illustrate that. What you're looking at here is a spinal cord section, and then you're looking at roots. Here are the ventral roots, which are motor axons, which are coming out of the spinal cord. And here are dorsal roots, representing sensory nerves uh, going into the spinal cord. And you can see that following inoculation with Synbis virus, this particular animal, and indeed all animals, lose virtually all of their motor neurons. So each little black dot here is an axon coming out at you. And uh, here you see about a 75% loss of motor axons. And indeed, it's about 95% uh, at about a month after this viral infection. 95% of motor neurons are gone. Motor axons are gone. And by contrast, sensory axons are completely spared. Indeed, when we look at other neuronal populations, no other population dies to the same degree. So this is a very interesting model of how motor neurons die. And we used to think that it was quite simple. Virus gets into motor neuron. This is a neuronotropic virus, so it infects neurons. And so virus gets into the motor neuron, and the motor neuron dies. And that was somewhat interesting, but it became more interesting when we observed the following. That motor neuron loss is non-cell autonomous. And the way we figured that out is that we did very careful studies and showed that really only a fraction uh, of motor neurons die due to direct infection. In fact, when you look here, you can look at the percentage of motor neurons that are directly infected. And it's a very small percentage after infection. And yet, if you look at the total number of motor neurons, there's a steep drop off that continues down uh, for about the next three weeks, such that, again, 95% of motor neurons die. But they're not all infected. Most die by a non-cell autonomous mechanism that became of some interest to us. So how does that happen? What cascade is set in motion by the viral infection that then triggers motor neuron death? So let me talk a little bit about excitotoxicity. Most of you will know this uh, to a large degree. What you're looking at here is a presynaptic neuronal terminal and a postsynaptic neuronal terminal. Glutamate is released into the synapse. And the point that I will draw your attention to is the role of the astrocyte. So the role of the astrocyte is to remove that glutamate from the synaptic space. It's a very important function. And if that astrocyte fails to remove the glutamate, it persists in the synapse uh, rendering that neuron susceptible to an excitotoxic injury. So this slide really is the summary of Jessica Carmen's PhD dissertation. And uh, she gets very upset when I summarize all of her work in one slide, but, uh, but I had to do it. And so what we used to think here is that the neuron gets infected by Synbis virus and, neuron, and the neuron then dies. What she found out is that really the first trigger 
is microglial activation. The microglia become profoundly activated in response to viral infection in the spinal cord, also in other regions. What do they do in response to activation? They secrete nitric oxide at very high levels, which can directly injure the neuron. But more importantly for this is they secrete TNF-alpha. And that's a very important cytokine because what it does is it causes downregulation of astrocytic glutamate transport. So the TNF-alpha, what she found, uh, reduces the ability of the astrocyte to remove glutamate. So that is truly bystander death. It's really astrocytic failure. And so that's the, the, the first take home point, that GLT-1. GLT-1 is the glutamate transporter on astrocytes that removes glutamate from the synapse. Uh, so at the mRNA level and the translocation of this protein to the astrocytic surface is inhibited during NSV infection resulting in astrocytic failure. Therefore, motor neurons die not by direct viral infection, but by excitotoxic death secondary to excess synaptic glutamate. Now, we have since gone on to look a little bit more at TNF-alpha, and indeed we've found that it is both necessary and sufficient to induce that GLT-1 downregulation or to induce that astrocytic failure. So the way that we've done this is we've said, okay, well, let's uh, infect Synbis virus onto cultures of TNF knockout sections of spinal cord. And indeed, in the wild type situation after infection, GLT-1 expression goes markedly down. That's the astrocytic failure I talked about. But in the TNF-alpha knockout state, that doesn't occur. That tells you really that TNF is necessary for that downregulation. But you can go one step further. You can not even throw in Synbis virus. You can actually just give TNF-alpha, and it is sufficient to induce that GLT-1 downregulation. What you're looking at here is a functional activity on the y-axis of actual glutamate transport. So it is an important factor in this astrocytic failure. So that's the take home point too. TNF is critical in astrocytic failure and therefore excitotoxic motor neuron death. And then by extension, NSV infection in TNF knockout mice should result in reduced motor neuron death and paralysis. But that's where it got complicated. So we did that. We infected TNF-alpha knockout mice with Synbis virus and solved this. And what you're looking at is grip strength. So as it goes down, these animals are getting paralyzed over time. And we found when we looked at the TNF-alpha knockout mice and the wild type mice that there was no difference. That the TNF-alpha knockout mice got just as paralyzed, permanently so, uh, to a large degree. And at this point, Jessica said, see ya. I'm gone. This is, get my PhD. This is complicated. I'm moving on. So this was left to somebody else to start to figure out in more detail. And so we did uh, a study which we thought would just simply confirm that we had been wrong, and we just counted the motor neurons. Now, if an animal's paralyzed, the motor neurons really are dead. They must be dead. 95% of the wild-type animals but when we did that somewhat boring experiment, we looked in the TNF-alpha knockout state and we found that they didn't die. In fact, the motor neurons were still almost completely alive. Here graphically represented by a wild type situation, motor neurons per section after viral infection dramatically decreased, very little so in the TNF-alpha knockout state. Quite interesting. So maybe we were right, right? Maybe that in the absence of TNF-alpha, they did not die in excitotoxic death. We know that's the case. They were still there. But then why the paralysis? Well, so we said, well, there are lots of reasons for paralysis. One of them would be upper motor neurons, right? So the lower motor neurons didn't die, but that animal's still paralyzed. Maybe the upper motor neurons die. So we thought about the various upper motor neuron populations in the tectal nucleus, the red nucleus, the vestibular nucleus, and even the corticospinal tract cortical motor neurons, and looked in the TNF-alpha knockout state, day zero and day seven, and we found no difference. So those neurons weren't dying, still didn't have an explanation for why they were paralyzed. So we then said, well, let's go to the neuromuscular junction, right? So maybe the motor neurons are alive, but they've pulled back from the neuromuscular junction. 
And so we've done a, a fairly simple experiment. We've looked at rhodamine conjugated bungarotoxin here to denote the postsynaptic side, and we've looked at motor axon terminals here. <clears throat> and we did this extensively in these animals, and we defined really those neuromuscular junctions that were covered. In other words, they still had motor axon terminal, partially covered or uncovered. You can see a few examples here. And the end result of this is that there was no distal axon pullback. So quantitatively, you can say, well, the blue here are completely covered neuromuscular junctions, red is partially covered, white is un or yellow is uncovered, and seven days later, there's very little difference. There's a little bit of difference, but not much, certainly not enough to account for this profound and complete paralysis. So we've ruled out spinal motor neuron death, we've ruled out upper motor neuron death, we've ruled out neuromuscular junction uh, pullback as a cause for this. So we started to look at the synaptic complement onto the motor neuron itself. And so we've done this with a series of studies, one of which is shown here. So you can look at synaptophysin staining around the termini of these motor neurons, in this case the cell bodies, but you can also do this on the dendritic arbors of motor neuron cell bodies. And so in a normal situation, uh, there are these widespread synaptic, presynaptic termini just really covering the motor neuron cell body and the dendritic tree. But, even, but in the TNF-alpha knockout state, even though the motor neurons survived, there was essentially no synaptic input onto them. So it raised the notion that these motor neurons were completely electrically isolated. They were no longer part of an electrical circuit and therefore they could not mediate motor function. Well, we looked in a little bit more detail, not just synaptophysin, because synaptophysin denotes all termini onto a motor neuron, both excitatory and inhibitory. But instead what we looked at are the excitatory inputs defined here by VGLUT1, which is a marker that defines presynaptic excitatory termini. And we found something that was even more impressive in that these excitatory inputs were dramatically and almost completely removed from the motor neuron cell body. So that we thought then underlied why there was indeed paralysis, that there was no synaptic connections between the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neuron. So this is really a schematic of uh, what a uh, synaptic arbor would look like on a motor neuron. As you can see, it's really covering uh, the uh, motor neuron cell body. And there's an extensive literature on this dating back to the uh, 1960s using an axotomy model. And in that axotomy model, the sciatic nerve is cut, and one of the first responses is for synapses onto the motor neuron to pull back. Now, if that motor axon ultimately reconnects with muscle, the synapses come back on. And there's even a little bit of data in terms of what triggers this. And that data suggests that when the motor axon is cut, the motor neuron upregulates NNOS, neuronal nitric oxide synthase, producing nitric oxide, which is a key signal for this, axon, for this um, pullback. Now, there's more information on this process. So microglia are involved. And so that data suggests that microglia migrate rapidly to the injured motor neuron. Again, this is an axotomy model. And it's a bit controversial, but many people believe that there is direct contact of the microglia with these presynaptic termini, and they physically strip away uh, the presynaptic termini. Astrocytes also play a role. So soon after axotomy, the tips become thin extensions which take over the positions of the microglia. So microglia come in first, astrocytes then encapsulate everything, and at three weeks after axotomy, if the motor axon has not reconnected with muscle, it's over. Because by that point, the astrocyte processes encapsulate the neurons, leading to a permanent deafferentation a permanent removal of the synaptic projections onto the motor neuron cell body. So that was very interesting. What I won't show you is, is data that we've got which says that indeed in our system, not axonomy, but really this viral encephalomyelitis, that one of the very early things that happens is NNOS is upregulated within motor neurons and nitric oxide is produced. Not from the other cells, from INOS, that comes later, but very early on, one of the first stress signals of this motor neuron is to upregulate NNOS. 
So we said, okay, well, we think that synaptic stripping plays a role in the paralysis, so let's block it. Let's stop it. Because maybe then these animals won't get paralyzed. And we were in for another surprise. So here is another grip strength curve here. These animals start off with a relative grip strength of one, and we take them over now 30 days. And if you look at the wild type in blue, we found what I had shown you before, that they get paralyzed. Again, this is a TNF-alpha knockout mouse. All of these studies that I'll be talking about are. And they ultimately recover a little bit of grip strength in the wild type state, and that's associated with a reafferentation to some degree. But when you block the stress signal from the motor neuron, that is, you block NNOS, so that motor neuron cannot send out that stress signal, not only is the paralysis the same, but it's permanent, so that they never recover any strength. And you can now look at the motor neurons, and you can say, well, in the wild type situation, remember, TNF-alpha knockout background, motor neurons don't die. But if we've now blocked this stress signal from the motor neuron, NNOS, now we converted it to an excitotoxic death and the motor neurons die. So it suggested to us that the stripping is a good thing. We had initially thought the stripping was a bad thing. So it seemed to us then that the motor neuron sends out this stress signal in a way to say, this is a bad time to have input onto me and you've got to pull back because the motor neuron at that point is quite susceptible to an excitotoxic injury. And uh, as one of my graduate students has said, well, maybe the motor neuron is saying, let's just weather this storm, pull back, get away, and then if we weather this storm, you can come back at a later point. And that seemed like a nice way of teleologically describing this. So we did then the other thing, which was we said, well, let's block the stress signal, but now let's block the glutamatergic toxicity. So we added a drug called Geiki, which blocks AMPA receptors, in conjunction with blocking this stress signal. So now we've not only blocked this deafferentation, but we've kept them there. We've kept the synapses onto the motor neuron, but have prevented um, uh, the toxicity associated with that. And when you do this now, you see that these animals recover over 60% of their hind limb grip strength. So there's a lot involved here, but it says that you need to deafferent for a period of time when the excitotoxicity can kill the motor neuron. But if you block both this stripping and the glutamate toxicity, you can recover from paralysis at levels that we have not seen in this model uh, at it with any other condition. So this is kind of a schematic of what that is. So here is your motor neuron, and NNOS generates nitric oxide, and in response, the synapses pull back to a safe distance so that the glutamate is no longer at risk of barraging this motor neuron and therefore killing it. When we blocked that stress signal, the synapses remain associated with the motor neuron cell body, and now we got excitotoxic motor neuron death and persistent afferentation, meaning they couldn't pull back, and therefore the paralysis was profound and severe and permanent. If we blocked not only the deafferentation by blocking NNOS, but we blocked the consequences thereof. We got reduced paralysis and death. We got reafferentation and recovery. So this then indicated to us that maybe this is, if we can understand this better, an important contributor to paralysis that's separate from cell death. Now I will tell you that I think this probably has some relevance in human motor neuron diseases. And what you're looking at here are motor neurons from uh, two separate babies who died with a motor neuron disorder, spinal and muscular atrophy, a genetic disorder uh, in which uh, in the type 1 form of spinal muscular atrophy, infants are born very floppy, very weak, they can't suck, and they die by about six months of life in most cases. And there has always been a paradox in the field that when you look at the spinal cords of these babies who were so profoundly weak that they had essentially no motor function, there's about 20 to 30 percent motor neuron death. Certainly not enough, it seems, to account for that profound weakness. And indeed, when you look at normal uh, uh, 
autopsied spinal cords. You see motor neurons with a nice, healthy synaptophysin complement around the outside of that motor neuron cell body. Here's another example here with a very robust synaptophysin complement, suggesting that indeed this is a, a normal way in which the motor neuron fits within an electrical circuit. But in the SMA, you can very easily see motor neurons, but there is essentially no synaptophysin around those motor neurons, suggesting that maybe that's part of why these infants are so weak, that there indeed has been a pullback of the synaptic input onto the motor neuron. So the take home point number three, synaptic stripping may be an important and potentially reversible contributor to paralysis. Now, I will shift to look at embryonic stem cells now, and as I indicated, first really as a biological tool to study human disease. And this all really was made possible by Tom Jessel and, and Hinnick Wichterly at Columbia when they showed us that you can take a mouse embryonic stem cell and you can apply sonic hedgehog and retinoic acid simply to the culture and these cells then go through a very robust and quick process of motor neuron differentiation such that by day five, there is a substantial number of cells in this culture that are post-mitotic and are true motor neurons by all criteria. They are electrophysiologically active. They are immunohistochemically just like motor neurons. So you can make from this technique motor neurons um, uh, in a dish. And the reason that they chose sonic hedgehog and retinoic acid is that in the developing embryo, the neural tube is exposed to two morphogens, sonic hedgehog from the notochord and retinoic acid from the paraxial mesoderm that basically specify what those neuroepithelial cells should do. And in response to those two chemicals, you get a spinal cord with a dorsal ventral gradient and motor neurons. Well, what Jessel did is he said, well, maybe the embryonic stem cells will do the same thing. Maybe it's that simple. And indeed, that's the case. And you can look at it here. So here's a, a, a confocal image looking at endogenous HB9 in red, co-localized with GFP. Now, in this case, there's been a little trick. GFP is driven off of the HB9 promoter so that as these cells become motor neurons, they start to fluoresce green because HB9 is a motor neuron specific promoter. So you've got other cells in this dish, but only the motor neurons fluoresce green. They have long, elaborate axons and dendrites. They certainly look like motor neurons. They express heavy chain neurofilament and they express choline acetyltransferase. You can even see here a fairly complex dendritic arbor and then the beginning of a long axon, the axon of which can extend even up to one centimeter, which I have never been able to get with any primary cultured cells, and, and I think it's very difficult to get axons in a dish which are of that length. So kind of a cool tool. Now, one of the first things we did is we said, well, that seems neat to make motor neurons, and maybe if you added muscle, you could recreate a very important functional unit that is the motor unit. So we took uh, myoblasts and differentiated them into skeletal muscle in one side of the dish, and took motor neurons on the other side of the dish and then asked them to talk with each other. And uh, we published this some time ago, so I won't go into this, but essentially what happened is the motor neurons extended axons over to the skeletal muscle, they form neuromuscular junctions, and the skeletal muscle starts beating in a dish. And that was a really interesting tool, and we've still continued to look at that as a developmental tool. For example, we can look at those things which are secreted by the skeletal muscle which attract the axon. And we found out that agrins are, are secreted once the two become aware of each other as we bring these two chambers into continuity. The neuron then secretes something called neural agrin, which starts to prepare it for contact with the skeletal muscle. So there's this reciprocal crosstalk that allows them to form this functional motor unit. So from a developmental perspective, that's kind of neat. What you see here are the motor neurons placed here, we had initially had a glass cover slip that separated these chambers. The skeletal muscle is over here, and you can see these long axons migrating out to and forming the neuromuscular junctions with the skeletal muscle. So from a developmental perspective, that's interesting, but how about applying that to disease? So we said, well, that's maybe a way that we can start to study spinal muscular atrophy in a dish. So we, there's an animal model for SMA and it uh, recreates the genetics uh, to a large degree of that seen in these babies who die with severe uh, spinal muscular atrophy. The animals 
who have this genotype also die a very profound weakness by five days of life. And so what we did is we generated embryonic stem cells from these mice. And the way you do that is a timed pregnancy and you flush the uterine horns at 3.5 days and you get this. So you get a series of these blastocysts in a dish, each one of which was destined to be uh, an offspring of that particular mating. And over time what happens is they will hatch out of the zona pellucida and you can uh, take these and individually culture them so that essentially each one of these becomes its own embryonic stem cell line and you genotype them. Some of them were destined to be the SMA offspring. Now, I make it sound easy, uh, but Jen Drummond has been doing this for about five years and it's really, really hard for a variety of reasons, the genetic background, the timed mating, how she uh, hatches these. She really feels like an owner of this and that she really feels like she's hatching these embryonic stem cells. It's taken an awful lot of time to figure out the expertise to generate embryonic stem cell lines, but we've now done it from, for example, ALS mice. We've done it from um, myelin deficient mice. We've done it from a series of models hoping to generate a cell culture model, which, for example, can be used for high throughput screening, et cetera. So when we derived an SMA embryonic stem cell line, we found that there was a little bit of a phenotype. Now let me draw your attention to, uh, these are called C10 and E2. These are two knockout lines. They grow, but they grow slowly when you look at growth kinetics. Okay, so there's a phenotype. These SMA ES cells do not have much SMN, which is the protein which is mutated in spinal muscular atrophy. That's the, the, the genotype, and so they grow a bit slower. But otherwise, they are doing pretty well. And then what we do is we make our motor neurons. And so here you're looking at a GFP staining of wild type embryonic stem cells that have turned into motor neurons. Again, the GFP is driven off of the HB9 promoter. So this is all motor neuron fluorescence in a dish, two separate views, very long, complicated cultures with uh, hundreds of thousands of motor neurons. Well, when we did that with the first knockout line, we were kind of surprised to say that, to find that they went through the same process and they actually did a very nice job, subtle differences, of extending axons out to informing this sophisticated culture. So they didn't look as bad as I think we thought that they would look. So we did another one, and I won't show you that data, but it essentially showed the same thing. They grow a little bit more slowly, but they differentiate into motor neurons just fine, and they uh, survive in culture with fairly long axons. So we, we actually went back and talked to one of our pathologist colleagues who made this interesting observation to us. And that was that SMA babies um, do fairly well for a period of time and that the axons, when you look pathologically, do indeed get to muscle in an SMA baby. This is not a problem with motor neuron development, axon extension, or reaching targets. But at the developmental time at which motor axons contact muscle, all hell breaks loose. And the weakness gets very profound and the axons degenerate and the, the baby then dies. So there's something about getting there, making contact with muscle, having reached their target that triggers then this degenerative process. So we asked whether or not it could be activity, that the motor neuron starts to signal, starts to have uh, action impulses. So we did a few things. We looked at an activity-dependent axonal phenotype. We activated these neurons in a dish. So we added in this case, potassium chloride. We can also do the same thing with glutamate, or you can actually just throw in muscle. And in all three cases, I'll show you the data for this, it results in a very profound axonal phenotype. The axons degenerate, followed by the SMA motor neurons dying. So you've recreated, in a sense, that developmental process in the SMA baby. So here again is a wild type situation. Here are all the motor neurons. This time we've added KCL, no big deal. They survive just fine for, period, for several days, even in the presence of KCL. But here's what happens to the knockout. So you see that although they looked pretty good initially, now they look terrible. Now you have cell bodies, but really short, uh, axons, you have 
uh, axonal segments which are uh, completely physically discontinuous with cell bodies and it is really this very robust axonal degeneration phenotype. At least at the early stages, no cell death, it's all the axon. Later on the cells will die. Here's another example of that. Here's another one of the knockout lines given a touch of KCL. And you see what I'm talking about here, this axonal degeneration, almost a beads on a string, these varicosities within the axon, segments of the axon which are physically discontinuous, which other parts of it, and then they just end in a short bundle. So we thought that was very interesting that we've recreated some aspects of SMA in a dish, and now we've got a phenotype. We also found something else that's quite interesting. We looked at whether or not these axons, now in a resting state from the SMA motor neurons, had enough mitochondria to withstand activation. So mitochondria in the axons are key for uh, allowing that axon to withstand the stressors of activation. So we said, well, can the mitochondria get there? This is again in the SMA motor neurons in an, a SMN deficient state, and the answer is no. And in fact, what you see is the mitochondria lined up right at the cell body, but for some reason they cannot get loaded on and they cannot get down the axon. So that was very interesting to us, and maybe that underlies why they are so brittle. They're so brittle because when you activate them, they require the mitochondria to keep up that activity. In the absence of the mitochondria, all hell breaks loose. So we asked another question, and this comes really from the Wallerian degeneration literature in which NAD uh, can be helpful to rescue an axonal degeneration phenotype. Um, this comes from NMNAT, which is an enzyme which is uh, critical for long axonal survival after injury. NAD is a coenzyme derived from the vitamin niacin. It, it synthesizes the de novo or the salvage pathway, and it's essential for ATP synthesizing redox reactions that are involved in glycolysis, but also oxidative phosphorylation, which of course require mitochondria. So we asked a very basic question, can the NAD rescue this SMA phenotype? So here is again that knockout. SMA motor neuron treated with a touch of KCL. Here is the same thing when you've given NAD. So it is very profoundly protective of this brittleness, this activity-dependent axon degeneration. The knockout line two um, here, and now with glutamate in this case, shows the same axonal degeneration. And when protected by NAD, you see a, a very nice preservation of the axon length and even the axon morphology. You can quantify this. And you can say, well, in no treatment, there still are some degenerating axons. This is defined morphologically. It gets worse with glutamate. So there's the activity-dependent process. Remember, the blue and the yellow here are the knockouts. Where, I'm sorry, the red and the yellow are the knockouts. The blue line here is the wild type. So both of these knockout lines have markedly increased degenerating axons, gets worse with glutamate, but looks very much like the normal motor neurons when you pretreat with NAD. You can look at axon lengths as well. So again, with no treatment, the axon lengths are quite similar. Um, in this case, uh, 250 micrometers on average. When you add the glutamate, there's a marked reduction. There's the activity-dependent phenotype that normalizes when you give not only the glutamate, but the NAD. Now, I will tell you that, although I don't have data to show here, we've recently found that the NAD uh, facilitates a redistribution of the mitochondria into the axon. So that's a nice correlate, that if you give the NAD, it for some reason allows the mitochondria to be redistributed into the axon, axon. And it at least raises the notion that the reason that they are resistant to activity now is because they got more mitochondria in the axon. That's just correlative at this point. We haven't figured out a way to prove that that's the link, but that's where we are so far. So the take home point four is that SMN deficient motor neurons have an axonal degeneration phenotype that is cell type specific. It does not occur, for example, if we take these embryonic stem cells and generate hindbrain neurons or forebrain neurons, neurons which are not involved in SMA. So it is something that is unique to spinal motor neurons, 
The SMN deficient motor neurons have reduced mitochondrial density, and NAD treatment restores axonal length and protects from axonal degeneration in SMN deficient motor neurons. So I will then finish with the concept of the embryonic stem cell as a therapeutic strategy. And this uh, came out last summer. And I'm going to go back now to those animals that were paralyzed with Synbis virus. So remember, that's a nice model for an adult mammalian host who has lost virtually all of the motor neurons. And we asked whether or not we can take these motor neurons, transplant them into that paralyzed animal, and get a recovery of function. Um, so for this application, we don't care why the motor neurons died, right? We just like the fact that they did because it provides a model for us to test whether axons could reconnect and could reform in vivo a new motor unit. Now, I won't go over all of the study groups. This was a several year study. I will summarize a few things. Uh, in all cases, we gave embryonic stem cells that were primed to become motor neurons into the spinal cord. That was clear. We learned the hard way through several years that that was not sufficient because nothing happened. So we found out why in uh, a few publications that you had to overcome myelin, that if you just transplanted these motor neurons into the spinal cord, they just stayed there. In fact, what the axons did is they migrated north and south within the gray matter because they were repulsed by myelin, so they never left. So to overcome that, we had to give something called dibutyl cyclic AMP and rolopram. This uh, dibutyl cyclic AMP, this was told to us by Mari Philbin that if you just increase intracellular um, cyclic AMP levels, that now myelin doesn't cause axons to veer away, that they will grow over myelin. It's no longer repulsive. And then Mary Bartlett Bungie at the Miami Project showed us that rolopram, which is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, also facilitates that. So we said, okay, let's include that as part of this. All the animals got cyclosporin to prevent rejection of the cells. And then finally, we asked whether or not you had to provide some bait out in the peripheral nervous system. So did you have to provide an attractive cue out in the sciatic nerve? And the reason for that, I've, I've summarized um, uh, several years of, of failure, which what we found is that the, if we could overcome myelin, they would leave the spinal cord, but they wouldn't go anywhere else. They would stay there. They would never go distally. They would never form neuromuscular junctions, and there would be no physiologic or functional recovery. So we thought that the reason that they were kind of meandering just outside of the spinal cord but going no further was because they didn't have a gradient to grow toward. And we knew that GDNF is a very good attractant to motor axons. And we knew that these embryonic stem cells had the GDNF receptor. So we said, well, what if we can establish a gradient within the sciatic nerve, and essentially these axons will grow up the gradient? And the way we set this up is we tested those things by excluding one or another in various cases, because there were, this is a complicated transplantation paradigm. So we had to kind of take every single variable and exclude it in one of these groups. For example, one of these groups got embryonic stem cells, but they had only been given retinoic acid. They had not been given sonic hedgehog. So, and yet they got everything else. So did we really need the motor neurons, or is just, this just kind of a supportive cocktail? And that's why we did these various groups. The end result is that, I'll summarize this here, that in group three, which was the whole cocktail, the embryonic stem cell-derived motor neurons, the dibutyl cyclic AMP and the rolopram to allow them to get out, the uh, GDNF applied into the sciatic nerve to establish a gradient. That was the only group that anatomically reconnected, electrophysiologically reconnected, and resulted in functional recovery. If we excluded anything else, they did not. Here's an example. So we would see them, this is long after transplantation, and this is a, a spinal cord section where you see by neurofilament staining three motor neurons, two of which are still expressing that GFP tag, right? GFP tag under the HP9 promoter. So we can distinguish those two who are transplant derived from this, which is host derived. And yet otherwise, they look quite similar. So they survive and look like host derived motor neurons. 
And when we do these various strategies like diburyl cyclic AMP, now what we see are GFP positive axons exiting the spinal cord. You're looking here at ventral roots. So you're seeing them having left the spinal cord. They've migrated through this minefield of myelin. And indeed, by six months, what you see in that group three, the full cocktail, is the establishment of hybrid neuromuscular junctions. So you're looking at a GFP positive axon now forming a neuromuscular junction with a postsynaptic density, again, rhodamine conjugated bungarotoxin. Now, this we've done many times with Z stacks and, and orthogonal views. I won't show you all that to say that indeed these are co localizing stem cell derived axons with host derived neuromuscular junctions. Let me show you a little bit about um, what, what, what I won't show you as well is the electrophysiologic evidence. So um, we wanted to make sure that there was physiologic evidence that they were active. And so Jeremy Scheffner, who's a friend of ours, would come down at episodic intervals and would do motor unit nerve estimations. He would actually do nerve conduction studies on them and quantify the number of functioning motor units in all of these groups, pre-transplantation, immediately post-transplantation, and then six months later. And what he found is that only in group three, he was completely blinded. In fact, we all were blinded until six months when we broke the code. So none of us knew which group had, w because the animals were housed together, had done what. And we found that at an electrophysiologic level as well, the only group that had electrophysiologic recovery was the group that had gotten that entire cocktail. That's the only group that had an anatomic reconnection. And indeed, that's the only group that had a functional recovery. So let me show you one of these animals if this comes up. Okay, so here is a pre-transplant animal. You can see that it is uh, paralyzed, especially in the hind limbs. It has very little movement of either hind limb, a little bit of the left, essentially none on the right. Here's that same animal now, six months later. And this is a fairly good animal. Not all of them were this good, but this is not the best either. So this animal did very well. Now I will, I, again, it, this, was, this was about the average. Some were better, some were worse. I will tell you one more aspect to it, that we wanted to ask what the GDNF was doing, and so we did a trick. We gave this GDNF gradient only on one side of the sciatic nerve because you could make an argument that the GDNF is just good. It's just good for you. And so high levels of GDNF systemically will cause axons to grow, right? And in that case, if we gave double the dose but only on one side, right, they should just grow to either side because it's a systemic effect. Conversely, if it is this gradient I've been talking about, when you give it only into one limb, the axons should grow out only to that side, ipsilateral. And that's what happened. So here is another pretreatment animal, I hope. So unilateral GDNF onto the right. <clears throat> so this animal is also quite paralyzed. You can see that the right limb here is not moving, although it is in a different posture. The left limb is splayed out behind this animal, a touch of hip flexion movement, but not much else. There's the same animal now. Remember, we only gave the uh, GDNF into the right side. And you'll see that I think the left limb is still quite bad, and the right is clearly much better. So the, the left limb is not doing anything else. It's still splayed out behind it. The right limb is now much more functional. So that done in a cohort, I'm just showing you one example, told, to, told us that not only was the GDF important, but it, it, was, it was important in a gradient manner, so that it was important as a tropic factor for axons to grow directionally to reconnect with skeletal muscle. So here then is the summary of that data. Again, group three got the complete paradigm. When you eliminated the rolopram, or you uh, put only low amounts of GDNF, or you didn't give the dibutylcyclic AMP, or you didn't provide uh, uh, motor neurons, you didn't get transplant-derived axons in the PNS, behavioral recovery, anatomic re or physiologic improvement.
So to summarize then, transplanted embryonic stem cell derived motor neurons extend to target muscle as long as you both neutralize the repulsive cues and to provide the attractive cues. They form neuromuscular junctions with appropriate pre- and postsynaptic specializations. Electrophysiologic labeling, I think, was important to suggest to us that not only had they anatomically reconnected, but that they were functionally active, and you got a partial recovery of hind limb grip strength. And I'll stop there.